Now, on to surveillance. I'm going to keep my contribution here as short as I can because a large part of this me lecture will comprise a conversation that I recorded last year with a student in the United States, which I think you'll find really interesting. To sum up the issue here, something has changed. Surveillance has always been around in one form or another, but technological innovation has transformed and intensified surveillance practices, processes and problems in many varied and many very big ways. Make sure you do the readings and explore some of the case studies listed. From experience, this topic has been very popular among students whenever it comes up, but to have an informed discussion and gain an informed understanding of this fundamental issue, you need to do the work. Why does surveillance occur? What are the driving forces that contribute to it taking place? Is it to increase efficiency and effectiveness? Is it to increase transparency, to prevent crime, to keep us safe, to protect us from all kinds of real and perceived dangers? Does surveillance arise because of fear? Or is it to make money? There is often a combination of factors at work. Is the surveillance society also partly propelled by voyeuristic pleasure, a fetish for watching? How carefully do we need to think about this issue in our own everyday lives? To take a relatively minor example, when I decided to tweet a photo of my new business card out there to the world, well to a small number of followers, was I being paranoid to black out part of my mobile number on it, or was I being strategic? Of course, surveillance isn't all bad. It's frequently used to keep us safe. It's employed by police in their efforts to find lost or kidnapped children. They might also identify criminals using various surveillance methods. Traffic cameras are used to monitor road safety. Baby monitors are now audiovisual and highly sophisticated. And local councils attempt to ensure that pets are microchipped so that their owners can be found if they go missing. That's the pets, not the owners. Just because Tiffany rarely leaves the couch doesn't mean lots of other dogs on my street haven't benefited over the years from being implanted with little metal objects. But when is it going too far? When parents friend you on Facebook or keep an eye on your Instagram? When smart cards are used in schools to track students' locations, library borrowings or eating habits? Deacon doesn't do as much with your student cards as a lot of educational institutions in the United States apparently do, but could it? And would you even care? Shit, I hope I didn't have to give that back. What about school crossing guards secretly filming dangerous drivers with hidden head cameras? Yes, it was introduced in the UK years ago. What about webcams in childcare centres so that parents can pay to observe the care of their children? Think I'm joking? Check out the study notes. We might instinctively feel that surveillance doesn't really impact on our lives all that much. But are we fooling ourselves? Many of the students in this unit do not know what it's like to live in a pre-9-11 world. You need to denaturalise surveillance. You need to make it strange. How vulnerable are we to those who watch us? Can we ever escape their gaze? Can we resist, or do we just give in? Think about this for a moment. How much surveillance do you tolerate? Do you even think about this? The naturalisation and normalisation of surveillance in present day society is profound. And to show you exactly what I mean by this, a few weeks ago I went into one of Melbourne's shopping centre complexes and I counted the number of security cameras in various stores. <laughs> yeah, you have a really cool social life. Now it's important to note that these numbers must be qualified in two ways. First, I only counted those cameras that were clearly visible to me. There may have been others in more hidden locations. Second, those cameras that I did see might not have been working, or they might not have been turned on, or they might not even have been real. This fake camera, for instance, complete with realistic flashing red light, will set you back a whopping $8. Now I want to talk to you about my journey through the shopping centre. But for what are hopefully obvious reasons, I don't have any images of this. Instead, and somewhat fittingly, I'm going to show you some images of Pentridge Prison in Melbourne, which were generously provided by Alethea Kinsella, a current Deakin PhD student researching surveillance for an adolescent novel she's writing on the subject. When I went into a clothing store, I saw two security cameras. A chocolate shop had three. A discount variety store had two, and somewhat ironically, when I walked out and asked someone, do you want to check my bag, they screwed up their face and waved me away. A jewellery store had three cameras. A fruit and veg shop had four. A post office also had four cameras. The news agents I went into had nine. A phone shop had 11. And the food court that I walked through had at least 17 cameras. Interestingly enough, a shoe and bag shop I went into had zero visible cameras. And when I talked to one of the staff there, she happily told me that they didn't have any cameras. 
Given that they only have one shoe out at a time and the bags were all tagged, there didn't seem to be too much risk for them. So much for the stereotypes perpetuated by film and TV about the kinds of products people often steal. Whereas in the phone shop I went into, which had at least 11 cameras, all products, the few that actually are in the store, are tied down with more staff hanging around per square metre than you'll see in any other venue. What's very interesting is that going around all of these stores counting video cameras made me very nervous and it even felt like I was a bit of a criminal. I was conscious of anyone seeing me looking at the ceiling of shop after shop and then surreptitiously typing notes into my phone. One part of your homework for this week is not to do this, but just to notice, and to notice surveillance. Wherever you go, have a quick glance around for security cameras. Don't film them, don't draw a diagram of the layout like you're planning your next big heist. Just see them. And of course, don't take pictures doing this, because you can't do this. Isn't it interesting that all these organisations are happy to film us all day, every day, but we can't take a single picture without having a very good and persuasive reason and getting express permission? no doubt with lawyers being consulted at times. I actually visited the shopping centre's management office to ask if I could briefly interview someone on camera there about surveillance, and maybe try to find out how many cameras there are, if they even knew themselves. I was given a business card and told to apply in writing, which I really didn't have time to do, particularly given that I quite likely would have been turned down if I got a reply at all. But I thought I could subvert the system. I didn't have to take this lying down. I went undercover James Bond style. Yes, I recorded rubbish bins outside the complex. Take that, anonymous shopping centre! Now think about this. It took me more than 10 minutes of wandering around to find as many rubbish bins as there are visible security cameras in one phone shop. So don't forget, for at least one week this year, notice being noticed. See that you are being seen. Watch out, because you're probably being watched. You're probably wondering why I'm giving so much emphasis to these images of Pentridge Prison. Well, there's something about this setting that you might not be aware of. This was the site of an internationally significant archaeological discovery in May of 2014. What you're seeing here are the unearthed foundations of a circular prison block from the 1850s. This prison block was one of very few that were inspired by Jeremy Bentham's conceptualization of the Panopticon, which later influenced Foucault's writings on surveillance. Prisoners were kept in solitary confinement under total surveillance. And this relates to one of the major issues which you're asked to think about this week. You've got a reading that talks about the ongoing debate over the relevance or irrelevance of Foucault's writings on the Panopticon. Have a careful think about the various case studies you engage with this week, and how they relate to Foucault's writings. In this age of digital media innovation, do we still live in the world that Foucault was describing? But surely this is too pessimistic. Don't worry about it. Just go for a walk and let all these things slip from your mind. Think happy thoughts as you walk among the trees and listen to the birds. We can all be friends. Akuna Matata. No one is watching us, are they? Now, let's move on to my conversation with Dr. Danielle Christmas, who wasn't actually a doctor when I recorded this, but was still doing her PhD at the time. I spoke to Danielle in 2013, in the aftermath of the PRISM scandal, which continues to be negotiated throughout the United States and indeed the world. Click on to part 3.